Hi, I'm Celeste Pilligard and all your classes are online now. Um, I study how students learn from different types of instruction, and so I wanted to share a few tips for how to succeed in your remote classes. First thing we're going to go over is learning from video lectures. A major misconception, but an understandable one, is that with video lectures you don't need to take notes or study because you can just go back and rewatch the videos whenever you want to. To talk about why this is a misconception, let's first talk about what learning really means. One way to think about learning from any medium is that you have an instructional method, and that method leads to either higher or lower test performance. The problem is that instructional method and test performance are the two least interesting parts of the learning process. The interesting parts go on in your head. So in between teaching and testing are cognitive processes. That means thinking and learning that leads to learning outcomes. Learning is a change in knowledge due to experience. So while instructional methods are shifting a lot right now and the types of tests that you take might be shifting too, these processes in the middle, they work under the exact same principles as you're used to. So what are those processes? Here's what you have to do. When new information comes in, you have to make connections between the different parts of that information. And so maybe that means thinking about how one part of what you're learning leads to another. And beyond that, you have to think about how this new information connects to what you already know. And these are the three questions. What is the most important information? How do the different parts of that information connect to each other? And how does that information connect to your prior knowledge? Those are the three questions that underlie any effective learning strategy, no matter if you're in a classroom or on your laptop. A difference between being on your laptop or in the classroom has to do with metacognition. Metacognition means thinking about thinking, so it's what you know about what you know. Socrates once famously said that I am the wisest man alive, for I know one thing, and that is that I know nothing. So he was making a statement about metacognition. In the classroom, that means answering questions like, does the lecture make sense to me? Does this fit with what I already know? Am I going to be able to explain this later? Can I use any strategies that will help me learn? And these are great questions to be able to answer. But the problem with metacognition is we are very bad at it. This isn't your fault or mine, it's just that we all have human brains and our human brains are very bad at making judgments about whether or not we're understanding something. And this is especially a big problem when it comes to learning with technology. What happens with technology is something that you can call an illusion of fluency. So when you're watching or listening to an online lecture, it is really easy to feel like you're making sense of it when really, Cognitively, you're not doing much of anything. So you're seeing and you're hearing, but you're not really paying attention in a way that will lead to learning. And so when that information goes away and you are no longer seeing and hearing it, you find that you really didn't learn much at all. So how can we successfully learn from video lectures? The first piece of advice is take notes. Now, taking notes might seem pointless because if you have access to the videos, the videos must be better records than any notes I could take, right? Here's the thing about taking notes. So if you summarize the lecture into notes, it helps ensure that you're processing the information in a way that will help you learn. And the key term here is summarizing. A summary is a distillation of the most important information and how it connects to each other. So by doing that process of taking summary notes while you're listening to a lecture, you're engaging in the active cognitive processes that will lead to actual learning. The next tip is to give it your full attention. All of these processes that we've been talking about are really effortful, meaningful learning, learning that is flexible and long lasting is hard and there's really no way to make it not hard. It can be really tempting when you're watching a video lesson to do something like, well, I'm just gonna watch this while I'm cooking dinner or while I'm playing a video game. Find a quiet space and don't multitask. If you think you're good at multitasking, you are not good at multitasking. Again, I am very sorry to break this to you, but we all have human brains and our human brains are very bad at doing more than one difficult thing at once. And there is just no way that you are a good multitasker when it comes to something that requires your full cognitive capacity. And so to give yourself the best chance at learning, set aside some quiet time when you're not going to be distracted to attend lecture just the same way you would when you go to class. 
And then after you watch the lecture, review your notes, test yourself, and make sure that everything makes sense to you. And if you're not a person who would ever go to in-person office hours, make that your resolution for this quarter. Go to the Zoom office hours. It might be easier for you to ask the questions that you have, but be sure that you get everything cleared up because you don't have the opportunity to do that in real time in class if you're watching pre-recorded lectures. Next is how do you study for online exams? Now, it's possible that the exams that you're going to be taking now that you're moving remote will be exactly like the exams that you're used to in traditional classes, where you're not allowed to use any outside resources. For that type of exam, whatever was effective for a traditional exam in the past will be effective now. What I want to talk about is something that you might be more likely to run into now that you're moving to remote classes, which is open resource exams. This means open book exams or open note exams, or one of those exams where you're allowed to make a little cheat sheet ahead of time or you have some limited space to take notes for yourself. A really unfortunate misconception about open resource exams is that when you have an open resource exam, it means that you don't need to do any preparation for that test. If you talk to faculty members who have experience with moving an exam from a closed book exam to an open book exam, it is not uncommon to hear them say that when they made that shift to an open resource exam, that the test scores did not actually go up. And the reason that the test scores don't go up when you make that switch is because when students know that they have an open book exam, they don't study. Here's what I want you to know. When you have an open resource exam, preparation is still equally important. Let me explain why. What's really important to understand is that access to information, so being able to look something up, knowing that all the information is somewhere in your notes, is not the same as understanding. And this is not to say that there aren't some things that are super easy to look up. And so, for example, if you are going to have a test where all that you need to know is definitions and factoids and formulas and names and dates, then you can probably get by pretty well just using your notes and looking up whatever definitions are coming up. But most exams that you're going to take are going to require you to know more than just factoids. And there are a lot of things that are really hard to look up or that you really just can't look up at all. You can't look up conceptual understanding. You can't look up emergent themes or the ability to make judgments about new situations. And you can't look up transfer questions. Transfer questions are questions that ask you to take what you learned and use it in some new situation. And so by definition, you can't look Look up the answer to those questions in your textbook because they're asking you, I want you to take what you understand and if you truly understand it, you should be able to make some inference beyond just the surface of what we went over in class. So how to study for online exams. First of all, study for open resource exams similarly to the way that you would with closed resource exams. There is no substitute for expert knowledge. And so you should do the same types of things to build that expert knowledge that you would with any type of exam. And so we know from the research that effective study strategies include things like testing yourself, teaching others, making concept maps, anything that requires you to really think about the underlying structure of whatever it is that you're trying to learn. If you are taking an exam where the instructor allows you to use some type of cheat sheet, first of all, make the cheat sheet yourself. There's a lot of good research in memory that shows that retrieval cues are much more useful when they were generated by the person whose memory is being tested. And so if you create the cheat sheet yourself, rather than say, asking a friend if you can copy theirs, you are much more likely to be able to use the cheat sheet effectively on the exam. Also, don't just try to copy everything. There's a good reason for this, which is that the act of organizing all of the information will actually help you learn the material. And when you get to the exam, you might find that you actually don't need to look at the cheat sheet very much after all. Last thing is understanding the pass not pass option. So this might not apply to you, but I just wanted to talk about it because more students are opting for this option than usual now. And I can tell you from experience that when a student takes a class, pass not pass, and then doesn't pass the class, it's usually not because they didn't do anything at all. It's because they just barely missed the mark, because they were aiming too precisely to get at exactly that pass mark, and they undershot it by a little bit. The misconception here is the idea that if you choose the pass no pass option, you'll be fine by just showing up, by just putting in the minimal effort. This turns out not to be the case. 
For example, let's imagine a hypothetical class where 70% of the points are coming from your performance on exams and 30% of the points are coming from homework. And you might think, well, I took it pass not pass. That means I should be able to do a little bit less work. So I'm just going to skip the homeworks and coast by on the exams. But think about the math on this. At UC San Diego, passing requires a C minus or better. In the typical class grading scale, a C minus is a 70%. So, if you forego any of the points in this class that you might be able to get from the homework, you have to get 100% on all of the exams in class in order to pass. So if you think of your classes in terms of having some pass threshold, and so maybe it's at 70%, you should consult your syllabus, what you should avoid doing is aiming for exactly the pass threshold, because there's always going to be a little bit of room for error. And if within that room for error are a lot of scores where you're not passing, and if we're honest here, we should probably shift this distribution down a little bit because we all tend to be a little bit overconfident when it comes to estimating how well we're going to do. So instead of aiming for exactly the pass threshold, aim above the pass threshold so that you have some wiggle room that when it comes down to the end of the term, you're not going to get some kind of unpleasant surprise. Also, if you're somebody who's receiving financial aid or military benefits, or if you plan to apply to medical school or graduate school, I recommend you seek advising about whether the pass not pass option makes sense for you. So three keys for success in remote courses. First, when it comes to learning from video lectures, take notes and give it your full attention and effort. Second, when you're studying for online exams, if they're open resource exams, that doesn't mean that preparation is not as important. You should prepare quite similarly to the way that you would if it were a closed resource exam. And finally, understand the pass not pass option and know that it can be really easy to underestimate what it takes to pass. Thank you for listening. Stay safe out there and good luck with this term.